record button because Saber does want these um, these events are recorded and deposited in the cloud on YouTube so that people can watch them after the fact. So the record button has been pushed and therefore we are on record mode. So I'd like to welcome all of you to the Saber Jack Graney chapter meeting. Uh, I know most of you, but my name is Joe Shaw and the, I'm the interim president of, of the Saber Jack Graney chapter. And we're really pleased tonight to have Travis Sachuk with us Travis and Ben Lindbergh wrote this book, this very widely acclaimed, well-received book in 2019, The MVP Machine. This is not meant to be a book club per se, but a conversation around the book. And just to be open and transparent, Travis and I talked about some, some questions that um, I would pose to him. And, and my role tonight is much like uh, Joe Graziola used to say, I'm going to throw you a few room service fastballs. And so the first part of it will be me tossing room service fastballs to Travis. And uh, there's certainly a lot of Cleveland flavor in the book. And so we're going to touch uh, somewhat on that. But uh, so the first part, we'd kind of like you to stay on mute. And it'll be the Travis, hopefully not impeded by Joe show. And the, uh, the second part, uh, We'll open it up and uh, for questions and conversations with Travis. And we've got between now and uh, 9.30 to conduct our Sabre business tonight. So again, Travis, thank you so much for being willing to come and spend some time tonight with us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So Travis, uh, just uh, it doesn't live too far away from me. It seems like a longer distance. He lives in Bay Village. I live in Fairview Park, but we've had several conversations that to, to prep for tonight, so let's get started. And Travis, I think the first thing is, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, and I admit that I'm trying to lead the witness a little bit here because you've got a fascinating background and, and uh, how you got to where you are today. So if you could just share the, some of the highlights you, you think might be of interest to us. Sure. Uh, so I grew up on the east side of Cleveland in Mentor, a Mentor high grad, and uh, so I, Teenage years, I grew up in 90s Indians and followed those with a lot of enthusiasm. I went to Ohio State for, for school. I wrote for the Lantern. Uh, back when newspapers were still uh, had total totally collapsed, I moved to the Carolinas to start some entry-level jobs there. I covered Clemson for the Charleston newspaper in South Carolina. Uh, I finally got inbo involved in baseball when... Uh, I began to cover the Pirates in a beat writing enterprise capacity for the Pittsburgh Tribune Review, and that was 2013. And it was good timing because the Pirates have just had 20 consecutive. I entered that year uh, where the Pirates had 20 consecutive losing seasons, which is a, a North American uh, big four professional sports league record. And they, Turned things around in large part because they embraced uh, a lot of sabermetric principles. They began shifting before that was largely in vogue. They invested in pitch framing and Russell Martin before that was widely adopted in baseball. They had a pitching strategy where uh, they either added two seam pitchers or had them teach the pitch. And that was really effective at creating ground balls before uh, batters learned how to counteract that in recent years with swing changes and whatnot. So. Uh, that was a great time. It went to three straight postseasons. It was a lot of fun to cover. Uh, based on that 2013 season, I wrote my first book, Big Data Baseball, which chronicled the Pirates' 2013 season and how that team was built. And then from there, I uh, moved on to Fangraphs, the Saber Metrics site. We were there for a few years. I contributed to the Athletic Cleveland before uh, in 2018, I took a job with 538 covering baseball. So, same sort of writing focus and flavor is Fangraphs, uh, just a different home, uh, oh. part of the Disney family there. So uh, yeah, that's how, and uh, it was with, uh, in 2018 is when I began reporting on the MVP machine with Ben Lindbergh and uh, just get, that story was kind of a natural progression of really what I've been reporting on at Fangraphs uh, and others had elsewhere, but it just seemed like more and more guys were improving themselves through uh, embracing data or unconventional uh, techniques, employing out instructors outside the professional ranks, uh, 
uh, working in unusual places, small gyms in the off season near their hometowns. Uh, and it just seemed like more and more guys were getting better out of, out of nowhere, whether it was Justin Turner going from a guy who was non-tendered by the Mets, a utility player to becoming a star with the Dodgers, Rich Hill having that late career renaissance. Uh, it just seemed like Daniel Murphy. Yeah. So many, there's so many, more and more of these stories start, start to accumulate. And by uh, the spring of 2018, uh, I started to think, well, this is bigger than a series of articles. Uh, when you have Adam Onovino building a new pitch in a vacant Manhattan storefront using an Edutronic camera and Repsoda device, and more guys are doing this. This is a movement. It's not just a series of articles. And uh, Ben Lindbergh, who I co-wrote the book with, we had the same literary agent, and we were both pursuing similar ideas. She suggested we work together, and we agreed. Uh, especially given the timely nature of the subject, we thought it was important to write about sooner rather than later. Uh, we agreed to you know, work on this, and uh, I think it was March of 2018. We wrote our proposal. I think we sold the book idea in May. <laughs> we didn't have any real. Uh, in March, we didn't have any commitments from players or anyone. We just had an idea, and that's. And then spring training that year, I approached Trevor Bauer at his locker and Goodyear. I said. Hey man, you'd be interested in working with us on this? And it's a good thing he said yes, because he became a very important figure in the book. Uh, and so, wow. yeah, that led to, uh, I won't go on too long, but that, that was how the book began. And we were very fortunate for uh, Trevor Bauer to open up, Kyle Bodie of Dryland Baseball, who Bauer worked with. As you may know, he opened up to us. A lot of executives from clubs, uh, you know, were, were willing to speak about this. And you know, the, we had a chapter on the Astros, which unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately has been tainted by some of their practices. We had to write a, an afterward to, uh, to to update the baseball world on what transpired in 2019 uh, for the paperback edition. But uh, yeah, we were very fortunate with timing and who was willing to cooperate with us. So, uh, and uh, I can talk about all sorts of book related things going forward, but that's sort of how I ended up here on the Zoom call tonight. Uh, you know, I ended up on the east, started on the east side in Menor, Ohio a few years ago, and now I've gone around circle the west side on a Zoom call. So, so that's how I arrived here. <laughs> as a loyal Buckeye fan, I have to say, and you overcame the time covering Clemson, right? That's got to be part <laughs> of it. <laughs> yeah, but, I was um, there for Dabo's first full season. Okay. And uh, they wanted him, many people wanted him fired in the second year when they, I think, only won seven games. So uh, <laughs> I bet a lot of people didn't admit to wanting that, but yes. Yeah, a lot of yeah. internet message boards want to dab gone then. So be careful what you wish for. Careful you know, give people some time. <laughs> I'm curious about the title of your book. I've heard uh, authors say that sometimes the most difficult part of a book is getting the publisher to agree with the title. Was that at all a challenge here or did it just come naturally as part of it, the evolution? It was a big, cha it was a big challenge. And uh, we, the title became parts of, uh, at least some, Ben and I submitted a lot of different uh, proposed titles back and forth with the publisher, and they didn't like any of them. <laughs> so they basically took parts of two and cobbled them together into the MVP machine. Uh, and you know, I I think it was an effective title. We didn't love it at the time, but the publisher wanted to appeal. They thought that would appeal more to a general audience, if you know, maybe a business. A uh, person looking for something to read on a flight or or whatnot. That okay, this is how we can build get more out of baseball players. And uh, there's this machine like quality that suggests it it works and it's there's a scientific basis to it. So uh, that's more how the title arrived. Yeah. More of a portability to other fields, in or is that kind of? I yeah, I think that was the intention. So, okay. uh, but the you know the publishers ultimately gets a say over. Uh, what the title is generally they are paying for the work and the production so they generally have the final word and so you uh, move on <laughs> you move on and you focus on on the job to be done so how do you how do you and ben feel the book has been received by the general public as well as the insiders of mlb yeah for the most part i think it was received uh you know quite well by the baseball community i mean a lot of folks in front offices, you know, were aware of, you know, that this was the player development 
getting more out of the players on your in your system on your major league roster was the the untapped field to really create competitive advantages. So it wasn't the idea wasn't a surprise, but even uh, folks uh, in front office said, you know, there's things we picked up from the book that we hadn't thought of or considered, which was nice to hear. And you hope when you dedicate a, a year of your life to reporting on something uh, <laughs> that you do reveal uh, uh, things that even experts, uh, it's new material to them. And I think it opened eyes to uh, baseball fans who uh, may have been somewhat aware, but not fully aware of what this movement and uh, this next uh, it's basically what comes after Moneyball, right? Moneyball, ever, there's been so many baseball books that have tried to be the next Moneyball. And that Moneyball is, of course, uh, finding, taking advantages of marketplace and efficiencies and really player skills on base percentage was a famous one illustrated in the book. Uh, but of course, every team began to value skills similarly. So the new advantage had to be something else. And we really think this marked a sea change where instead of, trying to identify undervalued skills teams, you know, the next uh, player development was the field that really needed to be challenged and uh, convention there, you know, what coaches taught, what, what tools, what technologies were used really needed to, to be disrupted uh, if teams were going to find a really ma massive competitive advantage as we argue that the Astros did at the major league level, uh, the pro level. So, uh, yeah, I think it was received overall pretty well. I mean, there's a lot of Trevor Bauer haters out there, and he's obviously made some missteps in social media. So a lot of people went in with kind of very negative feelings about Bauer. And uh, not that we we didn't argue that you shouldn't necessarily like him. I, I think the argument is that he has made a big difference in the game, and a lot of the practices and techniques uh, that the Indians use and other teams use, other players, he really played a pivotal role in ushering those in to the, the game. So even if you don't like his personality, you have to, I think, respect that he is, he's one of the pioneers in this movement. So, uh, he, I mean, there's some backlash on being, having him involved in the project, but overall he was great to work with. He's passionate about this. He was an open book. Uh, I met with him probably a dozen or more times uh, for hour long interview sessions, often at Crocker Park in Westlake where he lived uh, at restaurants there. So, uh, yeah, always be indebted for him, to him for uh, helping us with this project because it wouldn't have been the same without him. Yeah. Was there anything about the response to the book that surprised or disappointed you and Ben? Anything come out of left field? Gee, I would have never expected people would have perceived the book that way. I mean, anything like that that yeah. got you by surprise or you kind of got what you were hoping for as far as, far as response? Uh, it was, you know, mostly a positive response, but the the one area we did cover uh, n near the conclusion of the book was what this meant for, uh, in the financial landscape of the sport. And I think one thing that caught us a bit by a surprise was uh, the negative, uh, I think over time, media and you might have a better ideas of how, how the Cleveland fan base feels about this, but I think the sabermetric movement originally uh, was sort of pro ownership in a way where contracts were viewed uh, favorably by the sabermetric crowd if they favored the team. Like, oh, what a bargain. You know, they locked mm -hmm. up his the surplus value they created in this deal. Great deal for the club. Smart, smart front office. It was tough to be a smart front office if you were spending a lot of money. And uh, I think sites like Baseball prospectus and fan graphs kind of, you know, that's how they viewed the finances of the game. You, you, to be a smart front office, you had to extract value and uh, create surplus value. But in recent years, I think we're starting to see more of a pro uh, labor movement. And uh, at least in the media I follow and some of the fans I, I see interact on Twitter, and uh, people were concerned about what this meant for the future of. of uh, labor relations and player pay and minor league pay. And I think that's, we did address that to a degree. We didn't think it should be the focus of the book, but uh, rightfully so. I mean, if teams become better at player development, there's even less reason to ever pay a free agent if you have guys in the pipeline who you're developing. Uh, and you could see the game becoming even younger. It's already trending younger, but that could just, this movement could exacerbate that. So while 
getting more out of players can benefit Justin Turner and Rich Hill. And there are individual success stories and guys who have made a lot of money on embracing these techniques. From a macro level, you could argue it favors ownership more because it's going to create younger, cheaper, better labor. And they don't have to pay even late arbitration salaries. So some of that blowback was uh, a little surprising. I mean, we did try to cover it, but some felt it should have been a, a greater part of the book. I I kind of disagree. I think that's up to the union to ultimately negotiate a better contract for younger players early in their careers are better compensated. Uh, this will play a role in that, but ultimately every teams and individuals that don't embrace this are going to be left behind. So it's ultimately a, a good thing for the player and the team to try to embrace this and develop better baseball players. It's good for fans too. You'll see uh, a better brand of baseball. So I think it's ultimately a good thing for the movement, but there are some perhaps negative short-term economic uh, consequences for players. Okay. You, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about the, you know, the, the second version, the updated version. A year after you published the book of 2019 to critical acclaim, there's some incredibly positive comments from some very well-known people, including Brian Kenny and the original and, and, and the updated version. And then you, then the cheating scandal occurs and the updated version with another chapter. Could, could you take us through how all of that transpired in <laughs> such a short period of time? Was that your idea and Ben's or did the publisher come to How did that all come together in such a short period of time? Yeah. Uh, so when the, there's a whole, if you haven't read the book, there's a whole chapter dedicated to the Astros and we put them forward as a model organization and uh, adopting these, uh, the technology, you know, the edutronic camera for this high-speed camera that captures uh, picture grips and releases in this amazingly fine detail and biomechanical movements. Most teams in 2019 were just experimenting with their first one in spring training. The Astros already had 75 of them, many of them hard-mounted throughout stadiums at uh, different vantage points throughout their whole, their whole system. So they were capturing all this uh, biomechanical data that most teams were not. And that was just one example of how far ahead of the game they were in, uh, in this. They were trying to teach, they had ways to teach uh, catch a framing, play discipline that other teams weren't. So they were re really thinking all of this, pitch sequencing, what pitch types pitchers should throw, what locations, uh, you know, teaching launch angle from top to bottom. They were really on the forefront of all this. But what the Astros will be most known for in 2019 is, of course, banging on trash cans and uh, stealing signs and, uh, you know, that that permanent, very significant black mark on their legacy. And uh, so we had to address that in, in the afterward. And, uh, you know, we went, we documented that story. We, uh, we we tied in the Orioles too, where uh, several ex Astros staffers who weren't implicated in the sign stealing scandal, but are now uh, leading the Orioles front office were involved. We use, uh, we spoke with them about their process. We documented with the Astros, uh, you know, their, their 2019 campaign. So we tried, just tried to be honest about, uh, you know, hey, we wrote this glowing chat, mostly glowing chapter. Although not all glowing, because there were some real human costs. And the way the Astros treated everyone uh, was was certainly not perfect. But we we felt we had to be we had to address that in the paperback. And uh, there are a lot of other developments too in 2019 that we thought needed to be addressed. But we we had to bring uh, you know we're, when you write a book, a current events book, it's not quite the first draft of history, but it's close, so it's going to have. <laughs> you you know it's going to be challenged a little bit as you go to press, and uh, we weren't ex you, we couldn't anticipate a scandal like that. You know, some people mocked us for having the Astros involved in the book, but you know, in the spring of 2018 and that season, no one, very few people knew what was going on, so it was hard to yeah. prepare for that. So yeah, we just felt to be accountable, we had to address that head on and and talk about the other because there are a lot of positive developments. We really felt this movement accelerated. Uh, the player development movement really accelerated in 2019. So we did want to shine a light on that too. But yeah, the Astros really, <laughs> they took up a lot of the spotlight. Yeah. Certainly. Well, let's, let's turn to briefly talk about, as you yourself said, the Cleveland connections. And there are obviously several of them in the book. But starting with Kyle Booty, I did not realize, I did not appreciate till I read your book that he was from Cleveland, Parma, went to Baldwin Wallace and then headed west. But I also didn't realize till I saw that his father worked where I did at NASA Glenn Research Center. Never right. met him, but a strong <laughs> set of Cleveland connections. 
you talk a little bit about him and the impact that obviously we could spend the whole time talking about him, but who he is as a person and the impact he's having, has had, and is having on the game? Because he's an outsider coming yeah, in and affecting Matt. Right. Stage, correct? He is. That's right. Just as, uh, you know, Bill James was the outsider kind of uh, personified at Moneyball and Bodie is the outside the gates guy who, you know, crashed, tore them down and entered the pro game. And I guess it's fitting in some ways we're speaking today with, although they postponed the launch, it was, it was good to see a NASA SpaceX rocket ship getting ready to take off. Uh, I yes. think you know, that's something that could bring the country together. Uh, you know, one thing we could all like rally around. Uh, it's good to see. Uh, I hope that is a successful mission because it was good to see. And there's obviously Cleveland connections to NASA. And his dad, uh, one of the important, uh, Bodie, we'll talk about first principles, this idea of boiling, not reasoning by analogy, but boiling things down to kind of the, the, uh, the, science, the basic roots of how things work, whether it's relation to physics or other scientific forms. And, uh, you know, he remembers asking his dad how lasers worked when he worked at NASA. And he explained it, he explained it to him in very simple terms. And he felt that was an effective way to learn and to teach is to reason about for, 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 from first principles. And Elon Musk, uh, another guy who famously espouses the virtues of first principles uh, of learning, so learning and investigating thing and questioning and Kyle really applied first principles to baseball and he when he uh went out to Seattle to uh to live with his long distance he'd been dating a girl long distance when he moved out to Seattle uh, he was coaching a youth team and he he uh all the a lot of the practices the coaches were using and employing they couldn't explain in a way that satisfied him and uh he thought it really frustrated him he uh, he coached the ninth grade varsity team, or I'm sorry, the ninth grade freshman team for a year at a local high school. And he's basically, I don't know if he can really be fired as a freshman coach, but he was let go <laughs> because he couldn't get along with the, co the head coach of the varsity team because he thought all his methods were, were BS. And that really, that's what sparked driveline, the facility he would open up that changed baseball. And that's, he thought all these coaches were basically you know, full of shit and they don't have any scientific reasoning or methodology behind what they teach, what they preach. And let's actually try to qu quantify pitcher movements. Uh, and, you know, how can we, can we keep arms healthier? We, can we build velocity? What's the right way to throw? Can we quantify this in a biomechanical lab and ask questions of the data and, and uh, you know, use a scientific method? And that led them to an aisle of a Home Depot in the Seattle area and creating this very crude skeleton of a biomechanical uh, tool he would use. And yeah, he's, he's such an important figure because you know, I don't think he has every answer. He isn't right about everything, but he, uh, he's certainly been right about a lot of things about training velocity, about designing pictures, about uh, the way we think about developing arms. I think he's had a lot of positive impact. Uh, and he began, he threw out all, you know, the handed down conventional traditional thought. And he, he big, began with first principles asking why, how is this really, the, how should an arm really function? How should the, the body work in tandem with it? And yeah, he's, he's now with the Cincinnati Reds, basically running their minor league pitching operation. But uh, yeah, he was so important. And he, he ran into, uh, Trevor Bauer, when Bauer's at UCLA and Bauer was going to this place called the Texas Baseball Ranch, it was trying to develop, that was all about uh, doing unconventional things to develop velocity in arms and they would hold coaching clinics and uh, Bodie spoke there one, one spring and Bauer was in attendance and he, he was intrigued by some of the technology Bodie was using and he approached him afterwards and that's where that relationship began. And, uh, would flourish over the years. I think that was 2011, 12. I, I can't quite remember, but they're still close today. And now they're, of course, in the same organization. And uh, yeah, the driveline helped Bauer with clean up his mechanics. Uh, he designed pitches there in the off season. Uh, he's built up his velocity over the years. But yeah, they pushed each other, challenged each other, questioned everything. <laughs> Didn't make a lot of friends along the way by doing that. But uh, yeah, really important character. Uh, I would say he and Bauer are the two most important characters in the book. Uh, they're both they're both very much outsiders in how they interact 
how they question everything and interact with people. And they're both, you know, uh, insanely driven to uh, achieve things that most people would think, you know, Bauer wants to win like three Cy Youngs. That's most people think that's a crazy goal. He thinks he can do it. Uh, Bodie wants to revolutionize baseball. And a lot of people think that's crazy, but in some respects he's done it. So yeah, uh, two very important people in the book. So you mentioned in no leave Kyle Bodie, but it, well, I couldn't help but write this down. His title, the Reds minor league, Director of Pitching Initiative slash Pitching Coordinator. You need an oversized <laughs> business card. Again. Right. But the more serious question is, how do you think he will fit in the Reds system? That, that, there are a lot of people touching pitchers in the Reds system right now, right? How do you think he will fit? Do you think this will work, bottom line? With the way yeah, I, I, knowing him as a person and his, his teaching skills and approaches. I do. Uh, I think it'll have positive impact. And while he has, while Driveline has some general tenets and beliefs, they do believe in individual, individualized focus plans. And I think that's so important. And we've seen the Astros and other teams get a lot more out of pitchers, whether it's Garrett Cole or Charlie Morton or other people they acquired. Uh, maybe part of it is, you know, increasing spin rate through curious means, but it's also through emphasizing better, their best pitch or certain locations. And, uh, and similarly, Bodhi will look at what individuals do well, what they need to work on, and he will design, he will tailor development plans to that, which I think is very important, rather than having an organizational, this is the way we do it, and everyone's going to follow it. I don't think with the the feedback, the, you know, the, uh, the technology in the game today, you, you need to have individualized programs. So I think they will have success with that. And a team like the Reds, it was trying to play catch up. I think they were smart to kind of hand over. They have some forward thinking major league pitching coaches and Derek Johnson and uh, Caleb Cotham. I think they were smart to, uh, to hand over the minor league keys to, to Bodie and see if he could create kind of a driveline Midwest. Uh, I don't know if Cincinnati's Midwest. I guess it is. Yeah. <laughs> create, create a driveline Midwest. So, yeah. I mean, he's questions every, like he will bring in uh, weighted ball programs and for a long time, people thought throwing heavier uh, baseballs implements was dangerous to the arm uh, where Bodie studied it. And he believed it was important to, uh, to build essentially arm strength and teach the body also how to move implicitly naturally, rather than using verbal cues to teach, use these implements that are heavier or lighter and it'll sort of teach the body to naturally organize itself in a more efficient manner. And that was just one example of something very unconventional he's done that, he and Bauer have brought into baseball. And uh, now we're seeing weighted ball programs and, and the weighted ball implements scattered all, all over professional bullpens uh, throughout baseball. So, yeah, I think, you know, the weighted ball, the velocity programs, the pitch design, uh, you know, mapping uh, deliveries and looking for inefficiencies and areas to improve. It's, uh, I don't, well, though, there's always going to be injuries and I'm sure Anytime someone's hurt, people wonder if it's because of this new unusual instructor they have, but I, I think he'll create, he'll do more good than harm. Okay. So let's, let's turn to Trevor Bauer, the main event person, I, I think would be a fair statement in your book. You, you spent a lot of time with him. You really got to know him as a person, right? More, more than just a player. What, what were some of your takeaways about the holistic, the picture of Trevor Bauer? Many of us, I've seen the good, the not so good throwing the ball over the center field fence, et cetera. But, but you know him at a deeper level. And he seems to be a very intelligent person as far as pushing himself and trying to understand better the, I'll call it the basic physics associated with pitching. Would you agree with that? I mean, what's your take on Trevor Bauer as a launch point here for this element of our conversation? Yeah. Uh... Yeah, when he threw the ball over the, the wall in Kansas City, uh, the book had only been out a little while. And I looked at my phone and I saw Trevor Bowers trending on Twitter. I said, oh, no, <laughs> what happened? Uh, you know, I got to know Trevor pretty well. And uh, again, he was he was an open, he was passionate about baseball. And I think he cared. He believes he cares more about pitching than anyone else on the planet. And he might be right. It's, it's hard to measure such a thing, but he's incredibly passionate and he's obsessed about uh, 
you know, he's, he has that personality type where he just gets obsessed with something and drills down as deep as he can. Uh, instead of having a wide variety of interests, I think he has a few. And baseball is obviously one of them. And he's trying to learn as much about the craft and the science of it uh, as he can. And, and if there's any tool or any voice that can help him, he'll be interested in it. He's had this, he came to Cleveland uh, in that trade with the Diamondbacks with this reputation of being uncoachable and, and difficult. And I think if you, if you're a traditional coach and you accept you expected a player to accept your teaching and your word, you would think he's uncoachable if you couldn't explain it well and you didn't have evidence to back up what you're saying. And, uh, you know, is that behavior correct? You know, I, I don't know, but he was going to pursue what he thought was right. And he was going to push people and, and ask questions and, uh, and be allowed to do things a certain way if he thought they were best. And I think, you know, you look at, innovators in any field and they often piss people off and they're often ridiculed at first and they make people angry and they question things and I I think he's done a lot of the same he's kind of blazed that similar trail in baseball but if you look at the people more and more listen to him if you, if you look at India at the Indians dugout in recent seasons and you you know how they always pan to the dugout between pitches and you would see Bauer on the railing and usually it was Mike Clevenger or Shane Bieber or a right. younger arm talking to him. They weren't talking to Corey Kluber. They were typically talking to Bauer and I, they respected what his work ethic and how he thought about the game and they wanted to try to learn from him. Not that they would adopt everything, but uh, even if you look at Bieber and Clevenger's, their back, their backside arm action now, it's, it's very short. It's almost like a quarterback kind of very compact arm movement. And that's a Bauer influence from uh uh, they call it elbow spiraling. I won't get too technical, but it's it's almost like it's a very condensed arm action. Uh, and that's just one visible example of something they borrowed and picked up. So he, I think he unfairly got labeled as uncoachable and impossible to deal with, where if he felt you had good information, like Kyle Bodie, he would, you know, he would buy in and he would move out to Seattle and work with you all off season because he thought you were onto something. It was the people that only passed down conventional beliefs not that all conventional beliefs are wrong but if the people that just adopted it because this is what their coach told them and what their that person's previous coach told them uh yeah he wasn't going to accept that so uh yeah i think it is and in the clubhouse i you know people would call him a bad teammate i think he got that label too i don't think that was necessarily fair either i think he developed relationships in the clubhouse and even uh, you know, players would say they, you know, he felt if you have a teammate trying to make you better, that by definition is, you know, uh, generally being a good teammate. Now, throwing a ball over an outfield fence and distractions like that, I guess, are in the bad teammate category. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think there are lar large parts about Trevor that are uh, misunderstood. I think he's made mistakes and he'll admit he's made mistakes too. But at the end of the day, I think he wants to be remembered. For, he wants to be, he wants to be remembered for winning the Cy Young eventually, but I think he'll, uh, I think what's more meaningful is being remembered for you know, improving and pushing forward the craft of pitching. And I think that's what he's done. Do you think someday he could be a good pitching coach? I think he would. I mean, he, he claims after he's done playing, he wants to take over a small division one program and get recruit kids who have no egos and will buy into what he says and and do all these, you know, take all the practices he's always wanted to implement and try them at like a Dallas Baptist or a Coastal Carolina and try to take a program like that to the College World Series. So he claims that he claims he wants to coach afterwards. He I know he wants to do things in media too. He feels like players are underserved and how they're promoted and he has a momentum video operation now. So uh you know he's looking out for players to a degree too that I think baseball does a poor job in promoting their best players and yeah, that's yeah, something else he cares yeah. about so uh yeah we didn't again it wasn't it's not our we didn't make a judgment on whether you should like Bauer or not in the book we just said hey this is a guy who uh cares an awful lot about advancing the field of pitching forward and I think he should be respected for that and one, one last brief question about Trevor his dad has played a significant support role in his development has he not is and a variety of support. Right. I mean, yeah. Oh, you know, the people. I didn't appreciate that till I read your book, but that was fascinating to how important his 
dad was or is, I guess, in our past tense. Yeah, his. Uh, it's interesting because kind of you know Bodhi was influenced by the first kind of principle learning as he described it from his father and uh, Bauer's father was very involved in his development and Bauer's dad didn't he wasn't a baseball fan he didn't grow up really playing it uh, he came from a very modest background he couldn't he said he couldn't even afford to, you know, to buy the the bare minimum equipment. Uh, so he didn't really play baseball growing up. He didn't follow it. But when his son cared a lot about it, he became interested in it, as uh, a lot of fathers I assume would want to do. And uh, so he, appro Trevor's dad, appro approached pitching from a total outsider. I know nothing about it, scientific, but we're going to take a scientific approach to this. And what, how can we add velocity? What should we do? What sort of techniques? And he was very skeptical of like the traditional little league, you know, coaches and lessons. So. They they found uh, they went every they went to places like the Texas Baseball Ranch before that Texas Baseball Ranch was a thing. Yeah. I think Bauer was the first high profile Division One player to go out there, and certainly the first pro player to go out there. And that's from his dad, you know, and he's scouring the internet for new ideas. And they they brought the Edutronic camera into baseball, looking for a better high speed camera. Uh, you know, the Astros will debate that maybe they did, but right about the same time, the Bowers and the Astros were looking for the latest, you know, Bond, James Bond style gadgetry we could bring to baseball. And the Edutronic camera is what helped Bauer. Uh, when you think about his 2018 season, that great slider he had, he built that from scratch in the off season. He didn't have that pitch. And he used, he, th he threw thousands of pitches with that camera trained on him, looking at, uh, through that off season, early that regular season, looking for the right grip, trying to get the right uh, spin axis to create the perfect lateral movement he wanted to complement that vertical dropping curveball. And he ultimately did it. The second half of 18, that was one of the best sliders in baseball. So uh, yeah, his dad played a, his dad found that camera. His dad would go up the driveline with him and his dad would create uh, constraint tools in the backyard to help him or they, he built this kind of, uh, primitive tunneling, pitch tunneling device, you know, trying to get pitches to look the same uh, halfway to home plate, traveling the same trajectory before they break off and go different directions. So yeah, his dad had a huge influence. He would, Trevor would say that's his best friend and uh, they talk all the time. They, his dad does a lot of research for him. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a important baseball father son story. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, we could spend so much more time on Trevor and his father, but let's talk about the other side of the Indians, the offensive side. You spent several pages talking about Francisco Lindor and Jose Ramirez and how they use some of these modern technologies, techniques to affect some fundamental change in their productivity. Could you briefly touch on that for our, since we are a Cleveland crowd? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, I mean, when we think about, I think back six, seven years ago, uh, when Ramirez and Lindor were minor leaguers, no one was projecting them to hit with any power. I mean, I think Ramirez was hitting like a couple home runs a year in the minor leagues. And I think some scouts thought Lindor could be like a 15 to 20 homer guy at his peak. He had put on, I think in his pre-draft workout, he showed he had some power. I think he had a batting practice at Safeco Field in Seattle for the Mariners where he hit a few balls out and opened some eyes. But no one was projecting these guys to be sluggers. I mean, I don't, I didn't hear any evaluator or any fans on talk radio uh, suggesting they would be, but I think they're two great examples of, uh, you know, getting the most out of your skills and adapting and to new ideas and ways of doing things. Uh, and they joined, uh, not just Ramirez in particular, he didn't, you know, we've all heard about the fly ball revolution now, and we're all aware that more batters are trying to get the ball up in the air. And Ramirez isn't just trying to get the ball up in the air. He's, he was one of these uh, sort of like Jose Bautista in a way, trying to get up in the air to his pool side. I mean, you look at his average fly ball distance, it's not remarkable, but that he became like a 40 home run style batter with that five foot eight frame. No, not even probably this very unconventional build that he's squeezed this much power and ability out of himself through rethinking his swing, uh, trying to optimize contact. And I'm sure, you know, the Indians have the, uh, in the batting cages and uh, at their Arizona facility, they have all the hit tracking tools that show you what your exit velocity and launch angles are and all. 
And I think they use those to a degree, but I think they just intuitively understood here's a better way to do things that we've been enlightened to. Uh, I can be a power hitter. Uh, we don't think of guys under, we think of power hitters as being hulky guys, I guess in part because of the steroid era, but uh, you know, six foot three guys, a lot of muscle, the, the fact, and Lindor, I guess, has remade his body, but uh, these are two guys under, under six feet who have become power hitters by optimizing their swings and getting more out of their ability. And if, you know, if Justin Turner can become something of add power to his game, JD Martinez was not a power hitter. Uh, although he was a bigger frame guy, Lindor, Daniel Murphy, Ramirez, they're just two of the great examples of extracting all the talent out of your yourself that, uh, that you can. And I, I think they're great makeup guys. Like they love the game so much and they care so much about it. Sort of like uh, while their personalities are different than Bowers, uh, you know, they all care so much. I think that makeup is so important. And Lindor has always gotten 80 grade reviews for his makeup. And uh, maybe that's an undervalued tool now going in. You want guys with high makeup in the draft because you know they'll get the most out of their ability. And uh, yeah, I think they're just, they're great fly ball revolution stories who really took it to another level. Okay. So in the interest of time, let's ask one last question and we'll turn it over then to the group to ask you questions. This is the Travis Crystal Ball question. First, we had Moneyball, as you said, about, under, about uh, uh, identifying undervalued assets. Chapter two, the MVP machine uh, and developing your assets beyond their baseline skill level. What's the next chapter? What's the next major chapter that we'll see? The next book uh, that belongs on the bookshelf next to Moneyball and the MVP machine. What do you think is coming? That's a great question. You know, I would like to write that book. Uh, <laughs> well, we're giving you a heads up tonight. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. I had one uh, front office person reach out after our book came out, and he said, you know, there's – Basically, three areas you can disrupt. You can disrupt the, the, the undervalued skill market inefficiency avenue. And the Moneyball A's did that. Everyone caught on eventually. Uh, there's player development. You can do that better than other teams or individuals can do it better than other individuals. And now that we're just sort of in the early era of the early years of that movement. And he said he thought the third area for disruption was uh, in-game strategy. And... You know, maybe, I, you know, at first I thought, oh, well, haven't we kind of been doing that as an industry where, you know, the ships are everywhere and guys are spinning more high spin fastballs up in the zone. But there is a lot of in-game play and strategy that really hasn't been, I don't think, tested. I think, you know, like pitch calling, we don't really, at least publicly, I don't think there's a lot of good research on the value of, of a catchers or just pitch call decisions. And I think there's got to be value in sequencing. Uh you know, should we saw hitters be more aggressive early in counts, and I think there there's probably something to being aggressive on those zero zero counts, especially in today's game where you're going to see such nasty breaking stuff and uh, you know a, more breaking balls than ever before. So I think there's a lot of in game. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's something like four man out, outfields or uh, uh, just all sorts of different ways to optimize strategy play. He thought that was the third big thing. I, you know, the neuroscience field, I'm sure that's down the road. There's going to be a lot of insights and, uh, and how we utilize that. And uh, some people would say the whole, you know, the, I would lump minor league baseball in with player development, but some would say, you know, just paying minor leaguers a living wage is a market, you know, is a thing that would be a huge boost to a, to a club. But uh, yeah, I thought the strategy answer was interesting and there's probably a lot of investigation uh, you know, even the tunneling effect, I think, is kind of what are really the best pitch pairings and that sequencing. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of untapped area for there. But, uh, yeah, I still think we're sort of at the end of the beginning of this player development movement, and I'm curious to see how it plays out. But, yeah, it is, it is always fun to think about what is next, and there will be a next thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for enduring my room service fastballs. Uh, hopefully none of them <laughs> were high and tight. But, uh, no, those were good questions. But uh, <laughs> I, did, I thought, yeah, to have a good structure to a conversation, kind of go over material, I thought it was good to do in advance, and I think good, it worked out well. Good. good. Well, thank you. So why don't we turn to the second half and let people turn on their mics and ask you questions. I just ask you to do two things. Number one, when you turn on your mics, please identify who you are 
to Travis. And number two, try to keep your questions reasonably bounded so we give everybody a chance to ask at least one question. And with that, um, who would like to lead off? Oh, don't be don't be silent here, people. Come on. This is Dave Scott. Um, did Hi, Bodie or, or Bauer, hi, uh, did they ever feel any conflict between the need to promote their ideas and have people accept them uh, while protecting their ideas so that they didn't get poached by other folks? Yeah, it's, you know, I've asked them uh, the, the same question. Like, uh, you have this great competitive advantage, Trevor. Why don't you just, as he said, he, I could have been quiet and gone about this and, you know, maybe, uh, maybe the game and pitching science and pitching theory is three years behind where it is now. But he, uh, I don't quite understand the motivation for, for doing it, but I think he is something of a sharer and he wants to get this information out there. He wants to make a difference. I think if he can't win three Cy Youngs, he'd at least like to move the game forward. So I think, uh, which, uh, as any good teacher, I think, wants to share things. I think there is something he wants. He says he wants to be a small division one coach. So I think there is a bit of a teacher gene in there. So I think he's a natural sharer to agree to. Uh, but he did probably cost himself something of a competitive edge. If He's a self-described average, below average athlete for a major league player anyway. And if the better athletes, better pitchers start adopting his techniques, as we're seeing, uh, you know, Garrett Cole is a uh, college teammate and continued rival he becomes a dominant ace when he starts pitching more like trevor bauer told him he should pitch like back in ucla so yeah that's an advantage that's an example of uh, where he loses some competitive advantage uh, yeah bodie believes um i think that he's just built he has a head start now with driveline and i think he's built he believes he's just built a company that uh has a tremendous brand now has a head start has a uh you know, it has a strong brand, I guess, for lack of a better term. And he, he feels like, yeah, if we open this up, we'll improve overall baseball research. But he's confident that they'll always be uh, on the cutting edge, even if they're sort of open sourcing. Uh, you know, they're being very open about what they're doing. So it is interesting that they have been, uh, they have preached this so openly. But uh, I think we can debate whether that's, I think for Bodie, it's been good because he's now with the major league team and he always wanted to work for a club. Uh, and Bauer is, is known as a great innovator. So uh, even if it did cost him some kind of competitive advantage, I think it still had personal and league-wide, baseball-wide benefits. But that's a good question. When you think about the next development, I thought of um, improving the fan experience, uh, oh. not only at the ballpark, but also at home. And my fear is that gambling might be part of that. Um, but oh, I, people could have more fun uh, and, oh, make, and yeah, they would make more money as a consequence. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I was thinking just like baseball on field developments. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think especially as more and more states legalize it and, you know, you'll have the DraftKings app or the MGM app on your phone and sports, sports gambling is going to is a huge market and and you look at the stock market and there's a lot of bets being made that DraftKings and MGM and all these companies are going to do really well or Penn Gaming. Uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a huge new revenue stream in the sport. And we can argue about the merits of whether that's good or bad. I, I do think it will foster more interest in the game. I think the NFL is so popular because of the gambling and fantasy football element. And it could bring in some new interest, but, you know, gambling – some negative associations with it too for very good reason. So you hope people are responsible with it and it doesn't ever, baseball doesn't need a gambling scandal. No, you know, so we'll see where you this know, goes. You know, a lot of people are unhappy with the uh, pace of the game. Um, you know, you would think that there, there would be some things that would make the, the, the game itself a little more entertaining without violating the, the old principles of it. Um, yeah, the speed I, is, is one, you know, look at what the NFL is doing with this fourth and 15 thing. Um, they, they could do something to make the game more exciting without being a violation. Oh, I totally agree with you. And 
you know, Manfred is aware of this and Bud Selig was concerned about pace too. And I don't, I actually looked into this in 2015. If you remember the first couple months of the year, they had batters. You had to stay in the box with one foot unless you fouled it off or, you know, uh, you took a wild swing and you needed to take compose yourself. You had to stay in the box with one foot. And if you look at the pace, but the seconds between pitches, it had a significant impact. The game was faster the first two months. Uh, the first two months were sort of just a trial run, and then players were supposed to be fined after that. But then, uh, for some reason, the owners decided, no, well, <laughs> we're not going to do this anymore. But it had a real effect. Uh, I don't think it's so much the game time. I think it's really the pace people want to see, mm -hmm. uh, especially in this era of smartphones, where if you're bored for five seconds, you're going to look down at your device. I mean, I think baseball needs to uh, create a faster pace, the commissioner's office is very aware of this and you're seeing sports like soccer and basketball that are more free flowing. I think pick up some popularity share and baseball really uh, it's getting slower every season and they, they need to do something, but the fixes are somewhat easy. I mean, yes, you could have the clock, but you could always just keep the batters in the box. Uh, I think if you go back and look at games in the sixties and seventies, batters are not going out and doing their batting glove ritual and taking three practice wins between every pitch. So that would seem to be easy to, at least improve upon to some degree. The minor league clock seems to yes. be effective. Yeah. Uh, when you go to double A and below, that 20 seconds is a lot. I mean, usually it's 10 seconds or 15 seconds. And it, yeah. there, there aren't many auto balls and auto strikes. Uh, they, just, they just get used to it. And then when they get to the majors, they start dawdling again. How about yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. Travis, uh, my name's Ken Krasalovic. I just wanted to ask you, I haven't read your book, but you mentioned about, you know, you kind of focused on the Astros and what they were doing uh, a few years back. Um, Trevor Bauer was a critic of them before all the stuff came to light. What's your insight on all that? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty, pretty, until Mike Fires became a player to blow the whistle, it's pretty limited. I mean, there were a few, uh, if you remember in the playoffs, what was it, uh, the 17th, maybe the 18th playoffs, the, the A's had accused the Astros of doing some uh, banging on garbage or making some banging sound. They were suspicious. The Indians were suspicious of someone and the Red Sox with the uh, employee uh, walking around with the camera. So, but baseball said they investigated and there's nothing to it, you know, right? So, uh, yeah, there were some rumors and whispers, but – there was no uh, – Bauer was definitely suspicious of the pitcher performance there. What, what was Garrett Cole doing to become such a better pitcher? And uh, it's probably – you know, he and others suspected, you know, he's probably manipulating spin rate through, as many pitchers do. It's not just an Astros thing. A lot of guys will uh, use some substance to increase spin rate. And I went in the driveline lab. It works. I, if you apply substance to your hand, you will increase your spin rate. So it's an easy way to improve performance. Uh, so yeah, he was critical of that. And, but yeah, I, we didn't have enough to, I don't think anyone did to, if you're going to accuse a team of cheating, you have to have a lot of, uh, you have to have a credible source, credible evidence and until fires blew the whistle. I just don't think that existed. And I think, you know, there's been the Red Sox previously had a, I think it was a, with an Apple Watch, they had a sign stealing issue. And I, I don't think it's just the Astros using, uh, trying to s use technology to steal signs, but they were the most brazen about it. Uh, and they got caught. And, you know, we had a whole, read a whole new afterward <laughs> to kind of explain, you know, how, how a team can, you know, do something that would so tarnish their reputation, but also still be a team that other teams are trying to copy. They've poached a lot of their employees. They're trying, they did change the way uh, teams are developing players, the way uh, teams are thinking about development. You can be both and you can both innovate and be a bad actor. And I think the Astros, you know, managed to pull off both feats. You, they were so good. They're so talented. Why did they have to so brazenly cheat? It's uh it, it baffles me that an organization would let that occur. Well, one quick follow-up, if, if you don't mind. Uh, um, you know, you mentioned that, you know, they set the tone for other places. Well, a couple of guys that you probably then dealt with got out of there before the scandal broke and whatnot and are 
kind of in charge in Baltimore. Um, any thoughts on those guys and them leaving the Astros and whatnot and how that fits? Yeah. Uh, Sig was great. Sig worked with us, uh, worked with Ben. Uh, ben uh, spoke to Sig and he was, uh, he was great for the book and uh, we're indebted to him too. And they weren't, you know, implicated in the sign stealing. And I, you know, uh, I think Sig's a great dude. So I, I, I certainly believe him. Uh, Mike Fast, uh, Atlanta is another great guy. So I think, you know, there were people that left even before the sign stealing signal that broke that didn't like how Lunau and the kind of the culture that was developing in the Astros, uh, and they fired all their pro scouts and they were just, they traded for Asuna, which really a lot of people in the organization, the front office did not like that trade from a, from a, uh, from a moral standpoint, that was a very divisive move. And I think this kind of, when it all cost culture developed and not everyone was comfortable with, um, that created division in the front office. And you saw, even before the sign stealing, the off season before then, you saw some people leave. So there was a, there was certainly some, uh, shady practices going on even before sign stealing that we did document in the actual hardcover chapter. So we didn't try to say the Astros culture is perfect. We certainly raised some, some questions about it. Uh, uh, yeah. So we'll see, we'll see. I think the Orioles are going to turn around that program in part because of the Astros influence. I've received the Astros influence in other uh, organizations. So again, uh, the Astros prove that you can be the smartest guy in the room, but also, have some moral flaws that will that are going to do more damage. Uh, reputations can be brought down more easily than they can be built up, and I think they're a great example of that. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah, um, you had mentioned. Uh, about, Who are you? Who are you? Oh, sorry. Yeah, Blake Sherry. <laughs> Blake. Um, I was just wondering, does drive line and, and maybe even Bauer by saying he'd want to coach at a, at a college level, but, but where I'm headed is, is there some minimum age or maturity of a body that, that a, a organization like drive line would say, you must be 18 years old or you must be 17 before we're going to start using some of these techniques is there any lower bottom to that right no that's a good question and you know kyle began his studies on uh youth pitchers i think between the age of like 13 and 17 and most guys you see in driveline now are uh 18 and above uh, i mean you have a lot of college amateur pitchers minor league pitchers you don't see a lot of I don't know, actually don't know if they have an age restriction, but you don't see a lot of youth players there. It's serious development and uh, it's, you know, very high level amateurs and very high level pro guys want to be around each other and train with each other. Uh, but Bauer would, I mean, you have to, everything should be individualized. You, sh you should have some basic understanding of what your, what skills are needed to be uh, developed more than others. But, you know, Bauer was throwing a lot is a is an 11 12 year old he's throwing balls as far as he could it is a neighborhood park and he got he got the cops called on him for throwing balls against the fence so late one night a tennis instructor was trying to give a lesson was upset so i mean he he would say that uh for someone with his arm speed deficit and whatnot what he was doing at a young age he needed to do he needed to train at the young age and uh I think, you know, every body has its limits, but you have to stretch the body. Part of the lesson in this book is you have to stretch the body's limits through weighted balls, through long distance, through max effort uh, uh, practices. And we chronicled players who are basically 18 and older. So I, what Kyle would recommend for youth pitchers, I, I can't say for sure because we didn't develop, delve into that too often, but uh, you know, Bauer did do some of those practices as a young pitcher and most kids probably could stand to benefit from some level of weighted ball work, some max effort intensity. I mean, Kyle says the worst thing you can do with a you know six year old boy is play toss lightly with him. He'll pick up your motor, your motor, uh, the motor learning will be poor because he's seen these poor mechanics. You should 
throw as hard as you can against the fence and he should pick up those, uh, those body movements, those motor patterns. So uh, yeah, that's a good question. And I think there's a whole, I think the way we develop young kids and the programs they, they are on should be highly uh, scrutinized because I don't think there's a lot of knowledge there right now and you don't want kids getting hurt. But I think the lesson of Bauer is most kids at a young age can push themselves to some degree. And uh, there's that debate about specialization versus not specializing. And he specialized in baseball because he wanted to. Uh, I think kids should do what they want to do and play multiple sports. But he's an example of, uh, you know, there are benefits to specializing at an early age if you're that passionate about it and don't burn out. Thanks. There are questions? So, so since there's Travis, silence, Mike Tedrick here. Okay, go ahead. Down in Greenville, um, South Carolina. Oh, it's hey. Country. I yeah. love Greenville. I love Greenville. <laughs> yeah, we do too. Um, thank God for for Zoom, because I would never get to participate in any of these meetings <laughs> without it. Um, I had a question. I haven't read the book yet, but a lot of the things that I hear you reference in it are a lot of things that Mike Marshall was preaching years ago um and you know he spoke at one of the saber conventions and he was such a maverick that um the guys that he would work with uh the major leaguers basically they would just um they hate everybody in the organization would hate him so badly that they would just burn his guys up they would get him up and uh in the bullpen and throw and throw and throw and never put the guy in um and i was just curious a lot of the things you're talking about as far as mechanics and everything goes, was, was there any parallels with what Mike Marshall had done or did, did that come into your, into your book at all or with, the, or with that or, or was that anything that, that Trevor had looked at or Kyle had looked at when they were doing their research? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And uh, we have a significant portion of a Bodhi chapter uh, that kind of outlines his influences and Marshall is certainly one of them. Uh, he borrowed from he as he tried to learn about hey how should we develop pitchers he read as much as he could and marshall is one of those influences he didn't uh you know solely adopt everything he taught but there are i think marshall is big into wristbands and weighted implements and there's certainly things that kyle borrowed from him uh and we do we talk about those uh those influences and it's uh, you know i think it gets to the question of what is truly original i think it's tough to be truly truly original, but when you can have this kind of confluence of uh, confluence of ideas you're bringing together and techniques, uh, that, that confluence is important. And I think the right time, right place, I think if Marshall's in today's game, he probably would meet a little less resistance and he would meet some players that are more used to, he would love the technology, I'm sure. And uh, he'd meet players that are more open-minded I think on the younger end more comfortable with new ideas new technologies I think some of the timing is important too uh Branch Rickey interestingly is a huge I mean he doesn't get any credit for player development really we think about Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier rightfully so but Rickey not only did he vote the minor league system he was he invented the batting cage the batting helmet he tried to teach Duke Snyder plate discipline through you so there are all sorts of influences throughout baseball history uh, the Royals Academy that uh, a lot of today's best minds and player development are borrowing from and combining with something else to create their own kind of formula but uh, yeah Marshall was certainly an influence and we note that in the book and uh, you know Bodie would be the first one to tell you that too. Great. Thanks. Yeah, I remember he had mentioned that um, he wouldn't mess with a kid that was under 18 because of the growth plates. Um, they were still forming and everything. And he actually got kind of emotional when somebody asked him about that and how these guys will get out there and they'll just frag these poor kids, you know, in, in the minor leagues and have them throw all these innings and that sort of not the minor leagues, but even in high school and, and little league where they'll get them out in a the travel ball and, and, and just completely shred their arms and everything. And he, he was very adamant that that was too early for that, so. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, Kyle would say, if you have like an electric arm like Walker Bueller, you shouldn't throw that much because you are at, you're, you have more, fo you're generating more force than Trevor Bauer when he throws. But he would say someone like Trevor Bauer does need to throw because he needs to create, he needs to increase uh, 
the range of mobility in his shoulder and he needs to really train his body how to move as efficiently as possible and he needs to throw a lot all the time and probably at a young age too which he did so yeah i think individualized training is uh important it's just it's hard to i, I guess if you're under 18 if you're 12 it's hard to know <laughs> what yeah. individualized program you should be on uh but yeah there's definitely a, a diversity of opinion on how to handle young arms i think i think all we know is that as pro baseball has tried to really be careful with young arms a lot this basically in the 21st century we've seen pitch counts become part of every telecast and teams make decisions by them innings limits on first round draft you know young arms that are in the minor leagues and all we've seen is tommy john you know surgeries reach basically record rates and injuries keep going up so i don't think baby in arms is the right answer in pro baseball uh yeah i wish we didn't delve too much into the youth side and i think you know that's uh I certainly understand people not want you, you don't want to hurt a kid. Uh, but at the same time, the Trevor Bauer story is about pushing the limits starting at like 10 years old. So if you're not a natural born athlete, you probably do have to push the envelope. If you're Walker Bueller, you don't want to over. So it's a tricky, it's like, there's right. no, there's no one size fits all answer there. Yeah. Thanks very much for being on tonight. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you for the question. Other question. Hi, this is the Larry Bond. Hi, Larry. A lot of the things that you wrote in the book and that you've talked about tonight suggest that baseball is kind of an efficient market. When somebody's got a better idea, people adopt it, and they move forward. And yet there's always been a lot of talk in baseball about people being resistant. Uh, what's your sense of the balance of those things? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question because we – in some ways, it is very much a copycat game. On the other hand, there's a lot of people who have done it one way and are traditional minded and have resistance to. And I think what we saw with the Moneyball arc is, you know, uh, and really the Indians probably deserve credit. They, they don't get the credit for uh, bringing in that. They were basically the Moneyball A's before the Moneyball A's. I mean, Paul D. Podesta was like fifth on their depth chart when the A's hired him away from the Indians. So uh, the, the A's weren't the only team looking for inefficiencies in the marketplace for skills but we slowly saw teams you know throughout the late 2000s and early 2010s you know eventually every team had a quant and teams were kind of value um, base percentages no longer undervalued and we saw more ivy leaguers be hired to run teams less former players so we kind of saw teams slowly become more homogenous in how they think and who is being hired to fill leadership roles but it took like, you know, 10 to 15 years for it to totally spread throughout baseball. I think, and now with this, you're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, it's still in the early phases. I think a lot of the GMs say this, unlike Moneyball, this is playing out quicker. The adoption level is quicker. Uh, we're seeing coaching staffs change over quicker. Even as, you know, as we reported the book in 2018 and then as in 2019 uh, after it was released, you know, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of people I met at drive on in Seattle, a lot of the instructors there. And I think, wow, I hope this guy, you know, in a f you know, 10 years from now, I hope he gets a shot to, you know, be in a pro organization. Well, the next year, almost all those people were hired. Even like the fifth guy in the depth chart at drive line was hired by a club to do have some role in player development. So the change is really quick. And there wasn't, there wasn't even the supply of coaches that had this, knowledge and skill set and comfort with the technology to fill all these capacities. I had front office people reach out to me last winter asking if I knew people who could fill these roles and uh, be like, sorry, you know, most of these people have already been hired. Uh, so I think this, there's always resistance to new ideas like in any uh, human undertaking. I think this one's changed a little more quickly. Unlike Moneyball, this, the interesting thing about this one is I could see competitive advantages last a little longer because at Moneyball, the on-base percentage was playing out in the very, on the playing field. You could see how the A, what the A statistics were in the box score every morning or, you know, look up at fan graphs and see what, what does, where do the A's fall on these leaderboards? What are they trying to uh, acquire? What skills? But what happens behind Closed doors in minor league, batting cages, bullpens, uh, 
in the Arizona and Florida, you know, instructional campuses, that's a little bit more behind the curtain. So if you're like the Astros, you're able to actually build up this huge technology, uh, this huge tech advantage from 13 to basically 19, where you acquired, you know, 75 Edutronic cameras before most teams even had one. You are kind of able to do this quietly with not many people paying attention and you created a huge surplus value advantage. So I could see a team coming up with some player development revelation or teaching, teaching technique and kind of creating a multi-year advantage before the rest of the field caught up, which is a little bit different than Moneyball. But yeah, there, there is that natural uh, competition between someone trying to implement a new idea and someone resisting it. And yeah, baseball is a great market because baseball is so data rich, even player development now. Uh, because baseball is so data rich, it's a great marketplace for ideas to kind of duke it out because you have measurable results. The feedback loop is good. And the feedback loop's never been better in player development thanks to Repsoto and Edutronics and all these tools. So, uh, yeah, it's a great question. I think it's part of what makes the game interesting that you always have competing ideas and theories. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how these play out in this era. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Another question? So silence, let me ask a Pirates question because we have at least one Pirates fan in our audience <laughs> tonight who's already asked you a question. You wrote a great book when you covered the Pirates about data, data rich, big data to baseball. Pirates were one of the leading teams in this, right? What's, what has happened to them? They seem to be on a slide to somewhere, but it certainly isn't where they were not that many years ago. What, what has gone on? that has created such negative change in the Pirates? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I think the Pirates should be, if you're in a front office today and you want to think about long-term job security, uh, you should probably put the Pirates up on, up on the wall, picture of the front office, uh, the 13 front office, because things can, the game changes quickly. And the 20, I, I, I argue in the book, and I still believe it today, the, the Pirates' 2013 edge basically was derived from catching the second wave of kind of skill and efficiency and some strategy and efficiency in the Moneyball era. They were one of the they weren't the first team to massively shift, but they were one of the first. Uh, they weren't the first team to value pitch framing, but they were one of the first, and their first team to really sign a free agent, I believe, Russell Martin, uh, to a contract for his pitch framing skill. They they uh, thought the two seam fastballs undervalued and in that era of kind of lower power and before the fly ball launch angle revolution, it was a great effective pitch. If you could combine that with the, with the defensive shifts. And I argue, you know, they got, uh, they created a dozen or so wins out of just changing strategy and, and uh, who they had behind the plate. So, and, but they believed, I think that they had this, they had the formula figured out, okay, well, get these two seam pitchers and they'll do this thing, you know, they'll create these ground balls in a shift. And, uh, you know, we have this, there's a certain level of hubris there where they had think they believe they had a formula figured out, but the game is always evolving and adapting. And we've seen kind of the high spin fastball take over. We, the pirates were not trying to create power hitters then they were trying to, they were drafting a lot of, uh, they believe in an all fields line drive philosophy, kind of like the giants and the, and the uh, Royals had in those World Series teams in 14 and 15, and I guess the Giants in 12. Uh, they believed power was actually diminishing in the game. So they were, they had all these beliefs that turned out to be very wrong about where the game was headed, but they were kind of, they were very invested in teaching them all the way throughout their system. And they had something of a cookie cutter approach. Uh, and they also gave up, they didn't let guys, they got away from individualized development. And I think, there's no clearer case than the, the Chris Archer trade where they gave up, of course, Tyler Glass gave up on him, Austin Meadows, and Shane Boz, a recent first round pick who I think has a bright future. Uh, the Rays, they did not, those guys did not develop well for the Pirates. The Rays, they immediately became stars, like as soon as the Rays got their hands on them and made a few adjustments and how they swung or how they employed pitches where Archer, you know, has not pitched that well. So that's looking like, uh, that's like the Bartolo Colon trade of uh, <laughs> 20 years later. And it's just kind of emblematic of where the Pirates, the, 
they kind of failed to perceive that they could get so much more value out of players. They failed to see some of the strategic uh, movements on the field. And uh, yeah, so, you know, they went to three straight playoffs from 13, 14, 15. And then that front office, you know, six years later is cleared out after doing something that was you know, pretty, pretty historic in baseball, recent baseball terms. So you have to constantly be learning and thinking and adapting to this game. Yeah. One la last question. Uh, 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 I just want to say I agree with everything you said. I, I, yeah, this is Blake again. Hey Blake. Um, yeah, I, I, I do want to comment on one thing that you did in the book was uh, into some depth on how you implement some of these strategies. You can have all the uh, all the, the stats and, and know all these tendencies, but you covered how the Pirates needed to focus on A.J. Burnett and his acceptance of having a shift in infield behind him, that part of the success was having him buy into that system, which took this stats and made it kind of a, you know, it still is only going to work if, if everybody's in unison on that. And and I, I thought that was really well executed in your book that uh, I, I wouldn't have thought that that was that big of a deal. But the way you laid it out, I could see why it worked. Oh, thank you. Temporarily. Yeah, AJ, AJ did not like when the shift got burnt by like an off, you know, a trickling ground ball that went the other way. But uh, yeah. he did, you know, buy in to an extent and it helped that, you know, his natural skill set, he had that great sinker and, you know, it's just going to produce a lot of ground balls at the pool side. So, uh, you know, their strategy was a great fit for his skill set. And the Pirates did a good job of finding those guys. Uh, but yeah, you can't make Tyler Glass now be A.J. Burnett. Tyler Glass now has to be more like Garrett Cole and pitch up in the zone and just try to blow it by people. He shouldn't be trying to you know, produce ground balls and, and that sort of thing. Uh, maybe that's an oversimplification, but they certainly didn't play to Glasnow's skills. And they perhaps didn't, and even speaking with Glasnow since he was traded, he feels like the A's were, had become, they made much better database presentations than the Pirates did, uh, which is, you know, the Pirates had an advantage there in 13-14. They had Mike Fitzgerald and the dugout, the first kind of quant that traveled with a team. And now a lot, now every team does that. We call them conduits in the book, the people that can kind of uh, synthesize the information and make it digestible to players. Now, the Pirates kind of revolutionized. They created that role in some degree, uh, and every team copied that. <laughs> so you, you got to be constantly innovating and adaptive, especially as a, a team like the Pirates. The Pirates and the Indians are very similar in many ways, I think. In the ownership constraints, market size, uh, and they really have to uh, – be constantly ahead of the curve to compete. And I think even though the Indians haven't won a world series, I think this leadership group right now has done a really good job of, uh, you know, creating a product that's they developed a lot of good pitching at reasonable prices. They, you know, developed Lindor and Jose Ramirez. They've done a good job. And the lower minor leagues is really encouraging, I think, with what they'll, the talent they have there and how they'll develop it. So I think the Indians front office has done a really nice job. Well, Travis, our time is coming to an end, sadly. Uh, I would just like to steal a comment used by Stephanie Rule oftentimes on MSNBC after interviewing somebody. She would say, Travis, thank you very much for making us smarter. And, and you certainly have done that tonight. This is incredibly, I think, insightful, interesting hour plus we've spent with you. So we hope that you enjoyed your time with us and we hope sometime in the future you can come to one of our meetings when we have a real meeting, not an e-meeting. <laughs> it, it would be great to do that in person. Yeah, it's, it's great to connect with the you know, the Cleveland baseball audience. So it's uh, I moved away for a long time, but it's good to be back in the city. And uh, we, we uh, know where you are in Bay yeah. Village. So you, we, yeah, come we, hunt we, me down in Bay you. Village. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. It was a lot yeah, of fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. But before we ring off, just want to give a a brief moment of comment to our next meeting, and that will be Wednesday night, June 24th. Uh, it will be, again, a Zoom meeting at 7.30, and you'll get more, in, more information, but uh, the, uh, the uh, topic will be Major League Baseball playing with greatness, and the person there in front of us now, Mr. Ike Brooks, is going to give a 
three minute paid advertisement for it. We had to pay big bucks for this advertisement. And it was all in threes and sixes too. <laughs> Go ahead, sir, it's over to you. Well, well, thank you. And thank you for letting me join in. This is more of a scouting trip for me. Uh, over the past uh, decade, I've become pretty good friends with Vern Fuller. Some of you may remember Vern Fuller as the second baseman of the decade of the 1960s. And I can tell by the look on your face, it's Vern who? Well, <laughs> well, Vern spent his entire career with the Cleveland Indians and is, in fact, the second baseman of the 60s decade, which didn't say a lot for a team that didn't play above 500 on any of those years. But as I've been talking with Vern, discovered that not only did he play during an era that changed baseball, when you think of the numbers of teams increased, the differences in ballparks that they were playing in, that remember those old cookie cutters in Cincinnati, St. Louis, Philadelphia, you went in one, you went in all of them. Well, Vern also played against, with over 60 members of the Hall of Fame. And Travis, if your prediction about gambling is correct, there'll be another one in Pete Rose that falls in that category at some point. So we fashioned a presentation that talks about some of the experiences that Vern had, some of the experiences baseball went through, and who some of those Hall of Famers are. So that's the three minutes, Coach. You're worth every every bit that we had to pay for you. But seriously, <laughs> you get what you pay for. Great time. About, about a month from now, again, you all will be getting information, and uh, we think it will be uh, another great time to be had by all. So with that, let us uh, ring off for tonight, and thank you again for your attendance and your participation, and we hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, thank you. I think Travis was a great speaker. So stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Travis.